Amen. Today my uh, message is titled as the grass of the field. We're speaking on the words of Christ here. He's uh, speaking to his disciples. He gives a comparison to the grass uh, a few different times. Uh, in Luke 12, 27 through 31, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye that, uh, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither uh, be, of, be of doubt, the, sorry, a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of, of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Christ is speaking here to his disciples, obviously, as he sends them off to preach and to serve. He tells them to consider the simple grass and their relation to it. He also compares the sparrow in Matthew 10, 29 through 31 in the next verse. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word the truth of your word, and that you didn't put it down here to have a religious book or to have something that uh, people mindlessly believe because your word clearly declares that we should come and reason together, not that we should blindly follow, but that we should think on these things, that we should meditate, that we should learn of your word because your word is truth and that it helps us to live every day of our lives. It helps guide us. It helps teach us. It helps rebuke us and correct us puts down the pride, Lord. It humbles us. Lord, I pray that we would be humbled this day, that we'd see the truth in your comparison for us, that we'd see your love for us, that we would be encouraged to serve you as we ought to, emboldened to speak boldly those words that you have given us in your word, to call men to repentance, to show men their sin, to teach men what it is to fear God and to love you and obey your commands. I see in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a few things to note here that he compares. Both are comparing very small things that have little value to the world, and yet both have value in his creation. Obviously, the, the grass, we all know it. We like it, right? We lay in it. We go play in it. It's a very small thing. Like he says, it's here today and tomorrow's cast in the oven. The grass is always dying, but it's always regrowing. The little sparrow is a small little bird. No one who cares for the sparrow much, right? It's not worth much for selling, not worth much for anything. But God compares us to these little things for a reason, a few things that he's giving us. The second is his provision for both of these items. He obviously provides for both of these things. He has made a world that functions according as he has dictated it to do so, including us. He has given us laws to govern and guide us, to help us. <clears throat> the third item, if you notice, it's kind of a pointed item here is that they all wither and die. Even, the, even the, the Bible says the grass withers and tomorrow is cast in the oven. The sparrow, what? Doesn't fall to the ground. He's talking about his death. In this life, we're given, it's a brief thing. And God wants us to be cognizant of these things. That we are, the Bible says, but a vapor that appears for a moment and is gone the next. We have a very short time on this earth. Some 10, some 50, some 100 years. But... In, reality, in, the, in the reality of truth, as the Bible says, and eternity is after this, it is nothing. It is a blinking of an eye. We have a short time in this world, and we should consider these things. He gives the same comparison again in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And we see these things Christ is trying to get across. You know, if a if mother and father repeat themselves, it's usually worth considering, right? Well, when Jesus Christ repeats himself, as he does in several places in the Scripture, he wants it, he wants it understood, it's a truth that's being told. You see, one thing should be very clear is that Jesus is declaring that God has provided for us all that we need. 
He gives us in abundance more than we need. He considers our frailty and our failures, and still he provides for us. Very few of us can say uh, today was a good day when it comes to our sin. Very few of us can go through a week and say today wasn't so bad. Because in reality, we all sin, and we sin regularly. We bring to shame what God has done for us many times throughout the day. But God provided His Son. In the next verse, in John, 1 John 4.10, Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. That's a payment for the sin debt that we owed. If we've ever violated His law, whether in thought, word, or deed, in secret or in open, we have a debt paid through Christ. As a Christian, this is no small thing, for He paid us our debt to redeem us unto Himself. Salvation that is eternal, it is not a small thing. He provides a great thing. Above all other provisions, God provided His Son to us. There is no greater gift given, no greater value shown, in that the God of this universe lay down His own life for the wicked, for the wretched, for the wayward, the backbiters, the thieves, the murderers, the adulterers, the liars, and for all of those men, though we were his enemy. He provides for us his son. God also provided his law, the Ten Commandments. He wrote it on the hearts of men, and he put it in their conscience, so that the conscience would bear witness to the truth and would testify against them that their deeds were evil. Not just their deeds, our deeds are evil. If you consider them, as the Bible says, these are the things that God looks upon. And he says, yea, these things do I hate. And God has laid down the Ten Commandments for in the beginning, the foundation. And these are what men commit on a regular basis. These are what men make men worthy of death, hell, and damnation. Not because I was mean to my sister. Not because I was, you know, rude to this person. Or I didn't take out the trash. Or I didn't do these things. We make all kinds of laws to ourselves. The Pharisees were very good at it. The Pharisees, you know, stitched little beads on their little, their little uh, robes. All extra laws that they put upon themselves, pretending as though they were able to keep these things. And we do this ourselves. We, f we form our own little world and worldview that says, we're this good. This is how good we are. And we boast it in different ways. Many boasted in our performance at work. Many boasted in our ways we speak to others. But in truth, God sees his absolute perfection. So if we see that law that's written in our conscience, our conscience agrees with this commandment. All these commands, the Ten Commandments. This is why men always find an excuse not to say, I'm a liar, or he's a liar. Because, you know, in a politically correct world today, we don't want to call anybody by the truth of what they are. Aside from being human, we are liars. We are thieves. Think about it. No one wants to do these things because the conscience, it pricks internally. It's a, it's a very offensive thing. It always tells us tru the truth. I've never met a man or a woman who, or a child who is not a violator of the law who is not a liar, consider it. But none of them want to admit it, right? We don't like being called a liar, but we all are. God also gave his conscience to men, as he said in Romans 2.15, which shew the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You see, God gave us these things internally. The law governs all things in the universe. He re they receive these things in science. We see these things in science and these things at play in our daily lives. The science shows certain laws, whether they be thermodynamics or whether they be the eventuality of things that tend toward chaos, breaking down to their lowest form. We all know these laws and we learned them in science. You know, things wax worse. Everything breaks down to the simplest form. We see a law in this universe that came about because of Adam's sin. We see these truths evident throughout the creation. Even the grass itself is written with its own genetic code and a law that governs its growth, its health, and its life. God has written unto all things the law that governs them. Everything. Be it the skies, be it the seas. He says, who, who, who has the power to tell the seas to go and go no further? The land to come forth and to go no further. The skies to be where they are and to go no further. He controls all things. The Bible says all things are under his power, and he holds all things together by his will. Consider this. You know, we, we say in the world, uh, many lost to say, God is not here. He has no power in this world. It's not real. 
If God were not here, if he were truly to step out of this world, there would be no world because literally every bit of creation is held together by his will. In fact, in science, it's one of my subjects. One of the things we learn about, they talk about gluons, you know, all the particles that they look at, these things held together. They have no idea what holds them together because by all science laws, these things should be opposites. The electrons should shoot off. They have no idea, so they just call it something magical. Oh, let's call it a gluon. It's glued together, right? But it's kind of funny. The largest thing you see in the universe is these things orbiting each other. The smallest thing you see in the universe is these things orbiting each other. And none of them have any understanding why they even are able to function the way they are. We just have theories, ideas, concepts, but we have no idea. The Bible says it plainly. He holds all things together by his will. He holds us together by his will. He has given us life and breath. There is much God has given us. He gives repentance to man. In Acts 5.31, him God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You realize that repentance is not because you chose it, but because God broke the power of sin on the cross so that all men from Adam until the end, could repent. Because the Bible makes it very clear. He who commits sin is a slave to that sin. Period. When Adam cast the human race into sin, we became an absolute slave to the point at which we have no desire for life or for truth. Christ had to die to break that power so that we could look unto him. He gave us repentance. And we choose to do what we choose with it. Or not. We have been given a choice. He said, come, repent, the Bible says. He calls all men. He gives us this repentance. The grass may wither in the fields and the sparrow may fall in the fields, but there is new life that replaces it. There are those things that return again to be seen and known in the world. For the grass, though the blade dies, the root lives. The bird may fall from the sky, but his offspring lives and passes on that life to the next. Even God has given us repentance to, pa to be passed from death into life. As it is said, the old must die that the new may grow. The old man must die. The old person, as a Christian, must die so that the new life in Christ can live and grow. Even as the grass dies, uh, dries up and falls to the earth, as the Bible says, it dies but lives again and brings forth new life. Even it, when it talks of the corn, should not the, the corn itself die and the, and the seed be planted in the ground that it might bring forth new life? And this is the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ when he gives it to us. The old must die for the new to live, lest the old take all things with it to the place, like the Bible says, cast in the oven, even as the grass is cast in the oven tomorrow. <clears throat> In John 10, 27 to 29, he prepared them for heaven. John 10, 29, uh, 10, 27 to 29 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The power of God is such that when he redeems a man, it is for eternity. It is not some small thing. It's not to say, oh, you're cast in the ocean and someone pulls you out of the ocean and says you're saved and then casts you in 10 minutes later. You are either saved or you're not. God either does a redeeming work in your life or he is a liar. When he says he redeems you, he says no man can take you from my hand. Well, as far as I know, uh, I'm, I'm that same man that can no longer take me outside of that hands. No man, not myself or any other man can take me out. Even the, the Bible says not, not heaven nor hell any power nor principalities, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. There is nothing more powerful than our God. And when his word says he will redeem us, he has done this work in us because we have chosen to repent of our sins, because we have put our faith in him. He has given to us life eternal. My father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands. He makes it very clear, not only his hands, but his father's hands. You see, the grass, it says, never toils. In another place, the birds do not have to stock up, even as we do not provide for them, uh, even as we do to provide for ourselves, they don't have to for themselves. Yet they fill the fields and in the mountains and in the valleys, and the birds soar in the skies. 
and yet they don't prepare like we do. Even so, we being redeemed shall be in heaven and fill it with the, his praise. For our place cannot be taken and our root cannot be shaken as a Christian. We as a person may be shaken, but the root cannot be shaken. That root is Jesus Christ. No matter what the world says, no matter even in this times right now where our heightened security went up and they were talking about um, potential threats to us as Americans gathering together, and those of you who aren't, you, you put yourself in a body that possibly is in more danger. But in, the, in, in truth, who has us in his hands? It is Christ. Whether, whether you go to some foreign country in an Arab nation where they are fully in control, Christians die for the faith, even those who call themselves Christians who are no Christians are still going to die because they align with Christ. And because the Bible says the world hates Christ. And it makes it very clear. And this religion was started out of a disobedience to God in the first place. Everything in this world that is in sin despises the Lord. The Bible says even the creation groaneth and travaileth until the day that God will redeem all things. We should not be surprised or expect anything else than men wish to destroy us. God has given us something that cannot be compared and what he has given us cannot be shaken. Our confidence should be in him. God provides us an escape from temptation. As a Christian, this is a, a praise in Corinthians 10.13. It's one of the things I am glad for. It's one of the things I still fail at. He's given us a way of escape, but yet I still fail. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. As a Christian, God doesn't leave us defenseless or empty-handed. He provides an escape for us at all times. He provides strength for us at all times. God gave us his spirit to be within us, to walk with us. Not just a word in a book, but the power of the words that are in the word of God are living within us. For Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the spirit that fills us when we repent and put our faith in Christ. We walk after him. We have faith and confidence in him because he gives us strength to walk daily and he gives us an escape in all things we do. We go to work, we have those problems, we have those people that anger us, we have those sins that easily beset us and God is going to give us an escape for each of those things. The question is whether or not we're going to listen to them. It's just like anything. If you, if you love something, you get involved with it. If you love motorcycles, what do you do? You're always reading motorcycle magazine. If you love video games, you're reading the video game websites, you're playing the video games all the time. You get involved in those things. I know it's kind of nerdy sounding, but there's those things. Some people love books, and what are they going to do? They're going to read books all day long. If we love the Lord, we're going to be into and a part of, and we're going to love the Word of God and all that He has to tell us. We're going to want to read it. We're going to want to repeat it. We're going to want to share it. Think about those people you meet in your shop, like I always remember this nut guy, love motorcycles. The only conversation he ever wanted to have is motorcycles. As a Christian, no matter what our conversation is in life, if our true love is in Christ, it will come back to him. That motorcycle man, his true love was motorcycles. I'm sorry for his wife and family, but his true love was motorcycles. But as Christians, our true love should be in Christ. It should not waver ever when it comes to talking to others. Sure, we may be shaken on how we talk to them, but our conscience should go, this man or this woman may die. Do I care enough to say anything to them? It should prick us constantly, because it will. Just like a motorcycle man, everything reminded him of motorcycles. And as a Christian, everything will remind us of the leaf and the flower that withers, of the sparrow that falls from the sky, of the things God has given us in this world, realizing that he is the author of all life and creation. Realizing that at, at the end, every man will stand before him in judgment. When we speak to other men and other women, even other children, we realize there's not much in this world more valuable than what God died for. Because he made it of value because he died for it. Before, we were just as valuable as the leaf that withereth and the sparrow that falls. But Christ showed our value in his death. 
He said it was worth enough for him to die for it. And it's worth enough for us to live for him and to preach the truth. The grass is easy to trodden upon, and the sparrow is small, and the bird falls, and it's not very strong at all. But both are abundant. They even wear cast down. But both are abundant, even where they are cast down. I'm sorry. Even as temptation is thrown at us, and trials are abundant, we have victory in Christ, who is always there to provide. Galatians 6 2. It says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Consider this, he puts it the law of Christ. So fulfill that law of Christ. Our brothers give us strength, and God has given, to, and God has given them to us. Even as the grass woven together in the fields of the earth holds entire mountains together, believe it or not. In fact, that's what they actually want to stop soil erosion. The, the farmers realize that the grass of the fields, the very simplest thing, actually holds mountains and fields from eroding and destroying the earth on its own self because the winds pass and the sun kills everything. But the grass holds all those things together. It, it may be a small thing and of weak, weakness. You can grab it and rip it up. But yet the power of that grass holds our earth the way it is and it keeps it alive. And this is how we live and grow our crops and things like this. Because this small thing is banded together, even as Christ gave us brothers to band together, to strengthen one another. In a way, the Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. As a brother, as a sister, we sharpen one another in the word. We strengthen one another because we gather together as Christians in love. Strengthening and rebuking, correcting and instructing. Not just telling you, hey brother, I love you. Amen. God praise. God be praised. Let's encourage you. It's not all encouragement. The Bible says the, the wounds of a friend are faithful. I would rather have the wounds of a friend than what the Bible says are the kisses of the enemy, for they're deceitful. Because the wounds of a friend are going to tell us what we don't want to hear, but it's what we need to hear. Just as Christ's word, we don't want to hear it many times. It says very blatantly, you shall not lie. And who here hasn't? It says blatantly throughout the Ten Commandments, everything we violate. The wounds of a friend are faithful. God is faithful. He gives us this strength through their brethren. Matthew eleven twenty nine to 30 Take ye upon you my yoke, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus Christ is our ultimate brother. There is no greater brother, no greater Lord. He gave us his burden, which is free from the weight of the law's requirement. You see, the law requires death. The law requires absolute justice. But because of his mercy and his love, he was able to find another way than to give us justice. He gave us mercy and grace. He became a man that he might speak to us as brothers and friends. He came that he might strengthen us, even as the grass of the field is strengthened of itself, one to another. Even as it strengthens the whole fields together to keep them from eroding, holds whole mountains together from sliding down. Even Christ is a strength greater than the mountain. Christ is a strength greater than all things. The Bible says, if God be for me, who can be against me? There is no greater mountain that can come against the Lord and stand. And here we see the final comparison and the provision God has given us. He promises persecution. In Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Matthew 5, 11, he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You see, God has promised us another provision, believe it or not. It is a provision. He promised us persecution. He promised us trials and tribulations. He promised that we would have to pick up our cross. This is not a figurative speech, though it is a figurative speech. Figurative speech. It is a reality. If you live after Christ, if you even attempt to serve him, and you represent him in truth, meaning your life begins to change, you begin to love his law, you begin to love his word, 
Men will revile you. They will hate you. They will persecute you. Even as we as Americans are threatened right now, they will want to kill you in many, many countries and cultures. I do not equate the bombings of things right now to, to the same, but I say this, that men hate you if you love Christ. And God gave this provision for a reason. God has given us this even as the fields are given the pruning and the cutting down and the turning of the soil. The seeds are cut from the plant and they die, as the Bible says, that they might fall to the soil and be born anew to bring forth new life. Just as the Christians should receive persecution, but they might be brought low, that they might be brought low, even cut down or cast out for the sake of Christ. But God shall raise them up again, even unto the last day, and we shall have life eternal. You see, many things God has used. He broke God, he broke Job down, who had probably a better account than most of us. He took everything from him. Not only for Job, but those around him. Because I tell you, those self-righteous men that were his friends, that tell him all those things he had, God says, who are these fools who speak with ignorant words? Your friends. I'm going to rebuke them, and I'm going to tell you the truth. Many times we see, looking through history, we see men who have died for the name of Christ, been sawn asunder, been, been killed and slaughtered, uh, been done many other vile things to them in the name of Christ and against Christ. And yet, in China and things like that, the church grows heavily, from what I understand. And in places of persecution, the church grows immensely. Because persecutions weed out all the excuses. They weed out all the people that pretend to be it just to join some crowd, just to join some good thing. Because they realize they're going to have to die for it. And it becomes stronger. You see, no matter how strong our enemy is, what Christ does in us is even stronger. Because it is absolute. It is the Lord of the universe, the creator of all things. There is no power greater than what God brings to this earth in his justice, in his judgment, in his love and his mercy. They will revile you. They will hate you. They will persecute you. And God has given this to Christians that we might be pruned, that we might produce good fruit, more fruit, abundant fruit. He prunes us, even of our own wickedness. He prunes us by others' wickedness, who even slay us and harm us. He will prune us. Many, many good men or Let's put it this way, since the Bible says there is no good. Many men after God's heart who seek to serve him have been cast into prisons and unjustly accused, and we believe them. Because, oh, the justice system did it. But you know what? They'll have their day in victory with Christ because they've done unto Christ what is right and true. They've served the Lord of the, the world, the, the universe, and they're going to give account to him, and nobody else is going to give account for them, but only they will. And God has an answer for them. He is pruning them. And it's all his, his doing, his work. Who am I to say why he prunes, who he prunes, and how he prunes? I am nothing but the potter's clay. But I can serve him and love him because I know he's true. Even as Job, when he lost his entire family, what did it say before then? He'd sacrificed for them regularly. Just in case in their thoughts, they cursed God. Because he realized one thing, that when they died... He said, blessed be the name of the Lord who gives and takes away. Because he realized one thing absolutely true right off the bat. If my children are dead, I know that the only person who has any true justice has them. And he has mercy on them. And I have pled for their mercy. And I have taught them the truth. And I am confident that when they have died, they have been risen again with their Savior. If they were saved, if they truly repented. I know that there is no more justice than the justice God has. There is no more truth and mercy than what God has given them. Because when, when a, any man dies in this world, it is up to the justice and mercy of God and only him. Who are we to say, in truth, is unjust? Because think about it. We get angry because to our perspective, someone has died and their life has ended. To God, their life is eternal. One way or another. God made them and took them home in judgment or in mercy. Who is more just than the creator of this universe who takes that life and gives that life the same and does it all, the Bible says, with truth and justice, with mercy and love. There is no greater God, there is no greater anything in this universe than what God has given us.
one second. The grass may wither and the sparrow may fall, just as the Christian may be cut down in, the, in, the, in, his, in this life. He may be trampled upon by the wicked, may be persecuted by the envious and the covetous. They may be hated and despised by those who hate Christ. But there is one Lord and one Master who gives life that cannot be taken and cannot be trampled and will not end. We have confidence in this because Jesus Christ is our confidence. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He has redeemed us, and we should live according to this redeeming. We should live according to this mercy. You see, because the rest of the world doesn't have it. The rest of the world, the mercy is poured out, but it's trodden upon. As the Bible says, sometimes we cast our pearls before swine. Because what does the pearls, pearls to a farm of pigs, what do they do? They care not. They want only food. They trample in the mud. They mean nothing. It means nothing of value to them. The only thing of value to the pig is what? The belly. Our lusts, our desires are the belly. To the world, to the lost and dying, the only, the only value is the belly. What pleases me? What makes me happy? But in the end, the Bible says their, their end is hell and death. The question is, have we dealt with it? Do we care? And if we are redeemed, do we care about them? You see, we are as the grass and the sparrow but we are of far more value than it because God has made us of that value. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your encouragement in your word. I thank you for providing for us in all things. Lord, you have truly given to us beyond what we could ever ask or hope, beyond what we are ever worthy to receive. Jesus, I ask that you would break our hearts and show us the truth and help us to serve you as we ought to, to love you as we ought to. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Are you as the grass of the field that is renewed in its time, in its cycle, and has its place despite being trodden upon? Or are you branches that are cut down and are cast into the fires the last days and never have had root in them, and their end is destruction, never to enter heaven? The question is, are you born again? Are you truly saved? Have you ever truly looked at yourself in truth? Have you ever looked in the mirror of God's perfection, the Ten Commandments, and seen yourself in that truth? Have you ever seen how desperately you need the payment for Jesus Christ on the cross? You see, he died for a reason. It wasn't just because he's some religious man who died to make a point. He actually died to pay sin debt. Is your sin debt paid? He died on the cross to pay that debt of sin that we owe, not for some show. Is there a time in your life where you've been broken and weeping? realizing you deserve death and hell because of the evil of your entire life. Look into this mirror of the law, and you will see the truth. For if you've ever lied, you will see a liar. If you have ever stolen anything, no matter its value, you will see a thief. If you've ever hated anyone, you will know that you look into the face of a murderer. God is just and holy, and has said, Not one liar, not one thief, not one murderer shall ever enter heaven. Where does that leave you? If you're not a Christian today, where does that leave you? If you're just filling a pew, what do you have? The Bible says today is the day of salvation, now is the time. Look in the mirror and see the truth and turn from your sins. Confess them before Christ, here and now, and be washed in the blood of Christ. And he shall pay your debt that he paid with a great cost, the cost of his life. If you have any needs, come forward and ask the Lord to pray. Pray before him. Ask any one of us if you have any needs, whether to come to membership or anything. Please come. Stand with us as we sing.
everybody. Thank you for dismiss you with a song. Amen. All right. Sunday.